Okay. So we are waiting for our favorite guest to join us. Hello. We have the first one. Greetings from Bulgaria. I'm super happy to see you guys tuning in for our second office hour session. I hope you're having a great day so far. So please don't be shy. Say hi in the chat. Drop me a cool emoji and let me know where you're joining from. I'd love to know. While we wait for the others, I'll make a quick intro. My name is Laura. I'm a web performance fan and I am currently working on building content around everything site speed and core web vitals. With me, you see Atanas, a technical expert here at NitroPack. He has resolved over a thousand site performance issues, site performance issues for our customers over the last two years. So believe me when I tell you, you are in good hands. We will start off with a brief overview of the elusive HTTP requests, what they are, what they do, uh, when they do become an issue, and what the main causes for too many HTTP requests are. Then I'll let Atanas take over to share his favorite optimization techniques and apply them live. The session, of course, is being recorded and will be uploaded on our YouTube channel later. And of course, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on it. Okay, so get comfortable for the next little while and let's get this rolling. HTTP requests. If you're here, you know how hard it is to optimize for better site speed and performance. One of the most overlooked stats people forget to check is the number of HTTP requests. However, I should start off by saying that in their essence, HTTP requests are not a bad thing. It's actually how a browser and your server communicate so the content on your page can get rendered. And without HTTP requests, we wouldn't be able to access your awesome websites. So who wants that, right? So if HTTP requests are not bad, when should you get worried about them? To answer this question, we must understand that the number of HTTP requests equals the number of files that make a web page. So if your files are too many or too big, HTTP requests will grow in number and will take longer to travel back to your visitor's browser, which means people will have to wait for the page content to show up. And we don't want that. So the big question, how many HTTP requests are too many? I've seen people getting cheeky and suggesting they stuff all their files into a single JavaScript file. I can tell you that mm, this won't work in any way. Even though you only have one file, it will be a rather big one, which means a much longer time to transfer. So the result is quite the same. People waiting for a web page to load. Another rule I see out there is keeping your HTTP requests around 65 to 75 per page. And I'd like to put this to the test with two real world examples. So first we have Amazon. I am sure you are all very well familiar with Amazon. This is a super busy homepage filled with lots of images, text, sliders, buttons, we have it all. So when we inspect the page, the initial load shows 282 HTTP requests. That's a lot more than 75. And when I run the same homepage in Google PageSpeed Insights, I see an FCP of 0 0.7 seconds on desktop. As you know, FCP or first contentful paint measures when the browser renders the first bit of content providing the first feedback to the users that the page is actually loading. So this is their first signal, something is happening there and they might as well wait for it. Now, let's go over to Basecamp. It's a pretty straightforward homepage. It has the standard headings, several images, some buttons, your average homepage. The initial load shows only 43 HTTP requests. FCP, when we run it, through Google PageSpeed Insights, FCP is 0.6 seconds on desktop. 
So when we compare the stats, we see a huge difference in the number of HTTP requests, but the end users still get a super fast loading experience. And this is the most important thing, that people are happy and stick to your website. So what does that tell you? Looking at the number of HTTP requests alone is not a great move. You should always think of HTTP requests in the context of the specific web page. So instead of following the 65 to 75 rule, you should evaluate the complexity of a web page first. If your page looks like the one from Amazon and all the elements on it are vital for the user experience, going, going over 75 HTTP requests is absolutely inevitable. In this case, more advanced optimizations are needed. If, however, your web page looks similar to the Basecamp one, then an excessive number of HTTP requests is your sign you need to optimize some files. But what files are those exactly? As promised, Atanas will tell you more about which resources to focus on and share his favorite optimization techniques with you. So here is Atanas for you. Hi, guys. And girls, uh, my name is Atanas, and I'm a tech support at Nitro Park. I will go through uh, five different techniques that you guys can use to uh, reduce the initial HTTP requests that uh, the web the website has to make to to render the first visible part of the page, and they will be in the same order as you see them here. The first one is to use a CDN and leverage the browser caching. Optimizing images and videos is also important. Lazy loading them is uh, very crucial to reducing the number of HTTP requests. Using fonts the smart way is uh, related to how many fonts are used on a page. I'm going to demonstrate in a second. Unloading unnecessary resources and optimizing and combining resources where possible so uh, there are less uh, HTTP requests. This is a demo website website that I set up, and uh, it's a typical template with a few images. As you can see, we have some oranges here, uh, some images down below, text, different fonts around, uh, just a regular website. And the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, to leverage the, the browser caching and using a CDN. Right now, the website has no caching, no CDN, it's just plain WordPress. And we'll be looking at the network tab of the DevTools, uh, specifically in the all section, but it applies to any other tab here. And I'm going to refresh the page so I can demonstrate what's happening. The browser makes 50 requests, actually 51 for all kinds of different resources, and it has to download them into the browser before it can render the page. Of course, this happens very quickly, but you can imagine this at scale. For example, as my colleague Laura said, uh, Amazon, they have hundreds of products on the home page, and this will be very busy here. Uh, this is without browser caching. Uh, I'm going to switch my tabs here. I don't think you will see it. And I'm going to enable Nitro Pack on the website. The page is already optimized, <clears throat> so we will not be waiting for any optimizations to be generated. And I'm going to refresh the page one more time. <clears throat> this is since this is the first time. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, this is not the first time I am accessing this page. I was uh, checking it before. We are already loading the resources from the disk cache. And as you can see, the timing it takes for the HTTP requests, well, technically they're internal to the to the browser. They take one, one millisecond or so, and they don't take, take the, real, the real time it should take to, to fetch those resources from the CDN. If we check the page without NitroPack once more time, you can notice the, the difference in the time timing on the right side. So the timings went from uh, 1 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, etc. And uh, put simply, leveraging the browser cache is uh, suitable for websites that rely on repeat visitors. Uh, for example, uh, I have the 
the shop page here. Let's say I'm an online store and I'm going to browse through the products. When I visit the first product, it's, it's downloading the resources in my browser because I have not seen the product before. I'm sorry, I had this enabled. And if I go to another product now, it will not make a request to the CDN to get the resources. It's going to load them directly from the disk cache. So we're saving on loading time just by having browser caching enabled. And if I continue browsing, it will continue downloading the loading the resources from the browser cache. There are two types of cache. There is disk cache and uh, uh, memory cache, but we will not go into detail right now. I just wanted to demonstrate how browser caching can help with loading the uh, performance of the web pages. <clears throat> and moving on to the next to the next example, I will go once again on the home page and we'll be talking about uh, optimizing and lazy loading images and how they can reduce the number of HTTP requests. Uh, typically, when somebody comes to a website, they only see the above the fold part, this part here, and they don't see anything that's below. But if we don't have image lazy loading enabled, what happens is uh, no, Nitro Park is disabled here. There is no lazy loading. And if I refresh the page, you see that it's downloading all of the images, even the ones that are below my visible part. I don't really need to see them right now, but, but the browser is still making the get requests to get the images. When you have caching enabled, specifically a caching solution that also provides image lazy loading, and I'm going to remove the custom parameter now to load the page with a Nitro Pack optimization. We only download the first image. We only send one request <coughs> to get the, the oranges in that case. And as I scroll down, the rest of the images are loaded. This way, we are saving on uh, HTTP requests in the beginning, so the browser can focus on other important stuff instead of uh, downloading and placing images where they should be, because they're not uh, they're not, they're not really really visible in the beginning. <clears throat> and this was for the images. Uh, my suggestion is use always try to use image lazy loading. Check if your team has it. If your team doesn't have it, uh, install a plugin uh, who provides image lazy loading. If you want to use an online solution, there are uh, there is Nitro Pack. We we provide uh, all kinds of optimizations that I'm going to talk about uh, in the next minutes. The third topic I wanted to tackle is optimizing fonts. And I have a, a very straightforward page here with three headings. We can imagine that this is spread across our web page. And uh, the, the, the thing here, we are looking at the fonts filter. So when you load the page initially for the very first time, the browser has to download all of the three fonts. In that case, it's Roboto, Lora, and Montserrat. And usually it's not a good pr design practice to use many fonts, but I just wanted to pinpoint this because I have seen many websites use like five, six fonts, whereas it's not, uh, uh, it's adding up additional HTTP requests. And also the design is not uh, pretty straightforward. I, uh, I'm going to go into the back end of the website now, and I will edit this page to modify the fonts for those three, the, this heading and this heading. I'm going to change it to Roboto. And we'll see how we are saving two HTTP requests just by using the same font across the entire website. You may not see uh, my back end, but uh, it's going to be there in a second. Okay. 
So I have updated the page the page on the back end and I'm going to refresh the page as if I am somebody who's visiting the page for the very first time. So it will try to download all the fonts that are needed for this page to render. And now from having three HTTP requests, <clears throat> we are having one. We just saved 60% of the font related HTTP requests by using the same fonts. <clears throat> so my suggestion on the fonts topic is use fonts uh, enough to express your brand, enough to make the site look visually appealing but don't overdo the fonts, don't use five dif different font families because this is adding up HTTP requests to the, to the initial page render. Moving on to the next point, uh, it's related to, to having forms, uh, actually not, really, not only forms, uh, the example I'm going to give is with a form, but there are many plugins that do the very same thing. And what I'm talking about is that uh, some plugins, they put some of their code, some of their JavaScript or CSS files, they load them on the entire website, even on pages where the plugin is not really used. And I'm going to show how you can get, uh, how you can figure out and uh, disable such uh, resources so they don't take from the HTTP requests on that specific page where the resource is not needed where the plugin, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a very simple WP forms here and we're focusing here on the JavaScript, but we can do with, with the CSS, for example. Uh, when I refresh the page, the browser is going to download the, the JavaScript resources required to render this page. They come from WP forms, from WordPress itself and from other plugins if there are any. And I'm going to filter by WP forms, see how many requests we have here. And we have seven requests for resources related to WP forms. Uh, that's normal. They need to inject some JavaScript to the page to have their awesome features work. And that's okay, but that's for this page. I have another page which has no form on it. Just let me show the page. That's the, the page. It only has the heading and a button to go to the other page. And when I refresh the page once again here <clears throat> and have the WP forms filter as well, I see that there is a file frontend min.js from WP forms loaded onto the page. It looks like some kind of integration they have with Elementor because the demo is built with it. But we don't really need this JavaScript to load on this page because we don't have a form on that page. And the big question is, okay, now what? How can we get rid of this thing? We don't want to uninstall the WP Forms plugin for obvious reasons, we need the forms. And there's a very popular plugin called Asset Cleanup, which helps in uh, cleaning up resources from pages that are not needed. I will quickly go into the back end of the website once again and I'll show you how easy it is to uh, to unload the resource from this specific page. So the asset cleanup it provides a side menu on the left side and I'll go to the CSS and JavaScript manager that they have then go to pages to find that one page, which is called, there is no form on this page. And I wait, wait them to do their thing to fetch the resources. And it gives me a full list of all of the resources that are used on that specific page and also from which plugins they are coming. Uh, there are many resources from Elementor because the the demo website is built on it. But if I scroll down, I'm going to find resources from WP Forms. And this is this very same frontend.min.js file. And by simply unloading the file on the page, 
and saving the uh, asset cleanup settings. I have now told WordPress, don't load this resource on this page because I don't need it. And when I go back to the page and refresh it one more time, I still have the filter. So uh, we'll see whether there is anything from the OP forms loaded. And as you can see, the, the request is gone now. So we have also saved one more HTTP request. Of course, I'm talking about one, two, three, five HTTP requests, but uh, you can imagine this on scale on more complex website that have, uh, so let's say 30 plugins that are only used on two pages. And the good thing is that uh, Asset Cleanup also gives you the ability to unload entire plugins. But this is topic for another uh, office hours. So here we have also saved uh, one more request. As I said, if you multiply this by many plugins, many pages, and many different resources, it can quickly add up. So it's worth checking out. And moving on, moving on to the last uh, to the last topic which is uh, combining resources. I'm going to log out. Combining resources is when, uh, when you combine different resources into one. So the browser has to make one request and get all the needed, uh, be it JavaScript or CSS, instead of having to make 10, 20 separate requests. Of course, that's a, a, a new, uh, there are multiple ways to do it. And uh, there are plugins that allow combining resources. Uh, the hard way is to uh, go manually and merge all of the CSS files. This requires to, to touch the team files and it can break things easily. And if you have to change something in the future, uh, you have to go back and figure out uh, where where the CSS is, so you can you can change it, or you can use a solution like Nitropack, where we do uh, combining on the fly for every optimization, and we deliver only combined resources, so we can reduce drastically the the HTTP requests. I'm going to load the page without Nitropack to demonstrate and we're looking at the CSS tab because uh, usually the CSS is uh, the safest thing, thing to merge because merging JavaScript, combining them uh, can provide unexpected outputs. So on that page, we have 19 requests. And as you can see, there are various CSS files coming from different uh, plugins or from the team itself or from the page builder. And when I open the page with Nitro Pack, remember it's already optimized. So we are going to see a different thing here. There is uh, five resources that are combined. So we are going from, uh, let me open it in a new tab. We are going from 19 CSS resources down to five, which is like 75% uh, difference. And this can significantly help with reducing the, the HTTP requests. I just noticed that this is loaded from the disk cache. So I'm just going to refresh one more time with disable cache enabled to fetch it directly from the CDN. Yeah, there are still five resources. Uh, and after we have done all of all of the techniques that allow us to reduce the resources to to reduce the number of HTTP requests, I want to make a comparison on the home page when there are there is a solution reducing the HTTP requests and when there is none. In the first scenario, when, when we have a, a plain website with nothing combined and nothing optimized, uh, 
and images are also not lazy loaded. We have 51 requests in total. And when we have the same website, but if optimized, resources are combined, images are lazy, lazy loaded. The initial requests that are fired from the page are 33. So the difference is uh, 17, uh, 18 requests, which is uh, something like 30%. And again, if you multiply this on scale, if you have many images on the home page, or, or many, many CSS files coming from different uh, teams, plugins, builders, pop-ups, etc. Uh, the difference can be uh, really significant. Uh, these were my three, my five uh, techniques that have the most impact on reducing the HTTP requests. And Laura? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Atanas. I really love the techniques you shared with us. I see we have one question from Caroline. Can we use asset cleanup in addition to Nitro Pack? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there are features in asset cleanup that uh, overlap with Nitro Pack because they also have features like they, they minify CSS, they minify JavaScript. Uh, in that example, I was showing their feature where they allow unloading resources only and mm -hmm. this is compatible with nitro pack mm -hmm. however if you go into uh, their other optimization methods uh, this can produce unexpected results and i suggest that you approach this carefully and you can use our safe mode which allows you to to test different uh, configurations without affecting your real visitors Yep, and there's also a simple configuration you can do um, for the CSS combined feature. Uh, we will link it in the chat, so you can go ahead and um, explore it yourself. I don't see any other questions for now, I, but I would love to know which, which optimization techniques you guys think will be more, most effective for your websites. Uh, and I want to remind everybody that the recording of the session will be up uh, on our YouTube channel later. There you can also find the first office hour session on PSI's course, where Atanas shared other valuable tips from his vast knowledge. Um, and of course, if we don't have any other questions, feel free to, um, if you have no questions right now you can always type them in later we'll go back to the chat and we will try our very best to answer all the questions i want to thank everybody for joining us it was an awesome second session i can't wait for the next one already and i want to wish everyone an awesome day or night wherever you are again thanks for joining us and see you around. Bye-bye, guys.